Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to this second webinar of the learning series on 21st century skills. Uh, we will wait a couple of minutes so that all uh, participants are online, and then uh, we will uh, we will start with the uh, webinar officially. Thank you for your patience. Bonjour David, tu m'entends Bonjour, bonjour monsieur, monsieur Ido. Voilà, ok. Je voulais juste m'assurer que tu m'entends. Oui, oui. Je vais introduire dans une minute et après je vous laisse la parole. Okay. So I see participants are coming in. I think it's, um, it's time to start with, the, with this second webinar of the learning series on 21st century skills. Uh, as you may have seen from the invitation, this uh, second uh, event, uh, live event, will focus really on the questions related to curriculum, uh, teaching practices and assessment, uh, and the integration of 21st century skills uh, in the actual teaching and learning practices. Um, just before uh, starting with the webinar, let me remind some of the functions uh, of Zoom so that we can all uh, participate uh, in an active and uh, uh, organized way. Uh, for translations, uh, there is a, a live interpretation of this webinar and you can uh, activate it by clicking on the interpretation button uh, down uh, on your screen. Pour ceux qui se sont connectés, for those of you who are connected and cannot activate uh, the interpretation button, you just have to click on uh, the small uh, button, the symbol you have at the bottom of your screen. So I, if there is any issue, we can also sort it out as we go along in terms of uh, live interpretation. Uh, there is For this webinar, you will not be able to uh, speak uh, but you can pose your uh, questions in the chat function. Uh, if you, we encourage you to introduce by presenting yourself in the chat function. And then uh, throughout the webinar, you will have the opportunity to pose your questions. At the end of the webinar, we, will, we have uh, uh, reserved uh, 10 minutes for question and answers that we will pose to the, um, the presenters. Uh, those questions that uh, will not be answered live will be answered during the next two weeks in the Slack. Uh, more information on how to... Uh, in cooperation with UNESCO IAEP, thanks to funding from the Global Partnership for Education. Uh, ta talent, for those that do not know what it is, uh, is at the same time a task team of the Regional Coordination Group uh, of SDG4 in Western Central Africa and the regional platform on teaching and learning issues for the whole of Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, as of today, uh, in 
in the talent um, steering group, we have several organizations. Uh, of course, UNESCO uh, and particular UNESCO Dakar that uh, hosts the talent secretariat, but also some of UNESCO's institutes such as uh, uh, UNESCO ICBA, UNESCO IEP, uh, UNESCO Institute for Statistics. And today we have the opportunity also to have uh, the IBE, the International Bureau for Education. Uh, other members of the steering group uh, of talent are uh, ADEA NALA, ANSEFA, uh, CONFEMEN, Education International, UNHCR, UNICEF, and uh, REZAO. As I was saying, talent is really is working on this quality uh, education aspect throughout the continent uh, in order to uh, reinforce the common effort to achieve SDG 4. Uh, talent was started in 2016, and uh, throughout the last uh, uh, four years, uh, it has worked on issues related to learning assessment, uh, teacher training, and particularly 21st century skills. Uh, let me stop here. Uh, if you have any uh, further information about talent, we will encourage you to visit our website. Uh, and then uh, you can also pose any question related to that in the chat. I will now uh, leave the floor to uh, Mr. Ido Yao, Director of the International Bureau of Education, who will moderate this webinar. Mr. Ido, over to you. Uh, thank you, dear David, for this uh, introduction. I would like to start by welcoming all the participants connected uh, for this webinar and the regional director of the um, UNESCO office in Dakar and all their team, and also thank David for the organization and the follow-up and tell you how happy the International Bureau of Education is to be associated with such an important event. And I would like to say that I'm very happy that this talent initiative, which was born in Dakar when I was there, I was still there, has a, a has allowed uh, to bring people together to discuss the uh, teaching, learning, and assessment practices, and uh, discuss of uh, future competences. And I'm really happy uh, to, to have this initiative supported by the GPE and the different partners. And I would like to warmly thank the IIEP for allowing us to work uh, and be part of this event and say that I'm the operator, uh, the moderator for this session. My name is Yoi Ido and I'm the interim director for the uh, uh, International Bureau of Education based in Geneva, uh, focusing on uh, and interested in the curriculum. I would like to thank the organizers for allowing IBU to say two words at the opening of this session related to our work. I will start by saying that uh, this special webinar session could hardly be more timely. Uh, in fact, like medicine and business, education is now being challenged by events for which there has been inadequate preparation. The COVID-19 pandemic is a stark reminding of uh, the intensity, intensity, rapidity, and complexity of it historical events, but also the critical need for curriculum to become more responsive, adaptable, and proactive. However, how can curriculum respond effectively to the change and challenges of an uncertain future? The 21st century com context are fast changing and disruptive. Rapid advances in communication and information technology, growing urbanization, concerns for environmental sustainability, shifts in geopolitics, demographic patterns, and labor markets, increasing unemployment, especially for young people, and the growing divide between rich and poor, place and predestined 
pressure on uh, education systems to change rapidly and profoundly. Today, students need new and complex competencies, not only to lead economically productive lives, but also to live together in peace in a rapidly changing world and uh, to transform themselves into self-directed learners who can address their own wants and concerns and can advocate for their goals and aspirations. Also, for the best part, the Global Education 2030 Agenda will be implemented within the fourth industrial revolution, which is Industry 4.0 which is accentuating the pace, complexity, and uncertainties of future change. Yet, the future is complex and unknown. Education and learning systems must prepare learners, both young and old, for these unknowns future needs. For the IB, we think here that Achieving this goal demands the reorientation of national curricula to competency-based approaches. It also requires the transformation of teaching, learning, and assessment to best support the implementation of competence-based curricula. Furthermore, it demands focus, attention on the functioning of education and learning systems to ensure that they provide enabling environments for effective implementation of competency-based curriculum. Features of education requires feature curriculum. And the feature of curriculum itself is therefore complex. The IDE has been working on how to address this complexity. And we count on uh, the work and collaboration with the member states to really address the complexity that in each region has some specificities. The orientation of future curriculum toward competence-based approach has already gained momentum. This in evidence in, uh, the number, in number of countries that have been or are in the process of uh, reorienting in the past week, the IBE, has uh, received many requests from member states for technical support to reorient their curricula towards competency-based approaches. There are varying and sometimes contradictory understanding of competence and of competence-based competence curriculum. There is a fair amount of confusion between competence and its constituents parts. Different entity offer diverse list of uh, uh, competencies for inclusion in the curriculum, which actually turns out to be mixed feature competencies as a normative instrument to regularize dialogue and initiatives in the field and to safeguard the integrity of technical assistance offered to member states. This framework benefits benefited from consultations with global thoughts leaders and member states. The IBE framework is designated at the micro normative level and is ready to be applied to specific context. In conclusion, let me just say that the IBE continues to create agile and lasting initiatives that respond to the ever-changing environment of education and learning, the ability of education and learning systems to prepare learners for their future work and lives, the directions of which
Thank you very much, Mr. Ido. Uh, good day, everybody. So lovely to see you all and from so many different places. I think Mr. Ido has really set the scene very well for us. And those of you who were here a couple of weeks ago in webinar one will remember that we concentrated on the identification of a global shift in the adoption of 21st century skills or competencies. We looked at the frameworks, we found that many countries value the same skills, and we made explicit the need to align pedagogy, assessment, resourcing and curriculum, all aligned with the nature of the skills. Now, I hypothesize that many of the implementation challenges that are being experienced is due to the relative recency of explicit introduction of the skills with the accompanying lack of knowledge about their nature. And this has major implications. So today, we're going to look at what some of these mean for teaching and assessment, and we're going to look at some practical examples. Uh, this is just a very quick reminder that there are a lot of resources up on the IIEP portal. So do have a look at some of these resources. There's videos as well as articles that complement what we're talking about during the series. So you may recall from the last session, this process approach, which I showed briefly. And what this does is that it identifies the directive power of the nature of the skills on how we then integrate within curriculum and then how we support it through pedagogy and assessment and resourcing. So if we want to integrate 21st century skills opportunities, learning opportunities, then the first, the essential step is this one of understanding the nature of the skills, its structure, its components, and then also how it develops or progresses, i.e. a learning progression. Then we can look at how we can integrate the skills into curriculum and support it through these other areas of assessment and pedagogy and so on. So I'll highlight some aspects of these processes as we undertook them in the project that we mentioned last time, the Optimising Assessment for All. And in that project, we assembled a community of educators from countries in Asia and Africa to define, to describe, and to understand just a very few of these skills so that we could basically pilot an approach. And today we have two representatives from the Africa Optimising Assessment for All Teams uh, from Kenya and from Zambia. Now, what we did was focus on understanding first the nature of the skills so that then we could explore how to develop assessment tasks that would be based within the curriculum, within curriculum content. And we used the curricula of the participating countries. So we wanted to be able to make the skills visible through the tasks in such a way that then that facilitates deep student learning of the curricula while also developing expertise in the specific subskills that make up complex 21st century skills. So here's an example of the beginning of the sort of process that we used for identifying the nature of a specific skill. Now, if you look at this word cloud, maybe you can start thinking about what is this skill that all of these subskills would contribute to? So what is this particular competency. And so this is how we started with members of the country teams working together across countries. Um, and they were representative of the individual countries teachers and of their assessment and their curriculum um, arms. And they all engaged together in this brainstorming. They were informed by global literature and resources, as well as their own national resources, in, in part that came from their own curriculum. And so I assume that you've already worked this out. This was actually looking at the subskills or the components that are part of collaboration. So once we worked out what some of the contributing subskills were, we then worked out how they were situated relative to each other. 
And although you can't see it in a great deal of de detail, in this image you can see here, this is um, Lazarus Kalarani Keys and um, Beatrice, uh, who will be talking a little bit later, from Zambia. And they were showing one of these sort of structures of skills that shows all the contributing parts. And we use that structure to help to guide us in how we can integrate the skill into curriculum and how we can start designing and creating assessment tasks. So in other words, when you look at the structure of a skill, it's just like looking at the structure or the components of a history curriculum or a maths curriculum, looking at all the different parts within it. And the point that we're trying to make with this particular image is that that nature has major directive capacity about how you integrate into curriculum, how you respond with appropriate pedagogical strategies and how you implement into assessment. So very briefly, you can see here, this was the actual structure for collaboration that we worked from in the OAA Africa countries. And you can see the major subskills of participation, communication, uh, negotiating and decision-making. And then they again have subskills below them. So we often say subskills and sub sub skills, or you can say strands and sub skills, many ways. So these are all the different parts just for that one skill. So then we had to think about how can we use that structure to build or create assessment tasks? And obviously assessment is just one part. We also have, have to think about how do we integrate all of those different sub skills into curriculum as well as into teaching. And that is again, what Kenya and Zambia will talk about a bit more later in the session today. So when I talk about a task, we're typically talking about a task that has multiple steps and it has multiple questions in it so that students can work through these. And what you can see in this slide is a couple of different approaches that we took. One approach was that we took national or existing items. And you may remember in the first webinar that this was discussed um, by our colleague from Senegal. So we use existing items and then we just use them um, and use the opportunities they present to test the skills. Then another approach is that we identify a topic within the curriculum and then we create a task around this using a template. And I'm just going to demonstrate that template approach. So these slides look much more complicated than they are, of course, because we have both languages on the screen. So, you know, it wouldn't look quite so impenetrable if we, if we had single slides. Now here I'm taking a problem solving approach rather than the collaboration or problem solving example rather than collaboration. So once you have knowledge about the skill and the structure of the skill and of course the expected levels of proficiency, which I'm not covering right now, we can apply this to the task creation. So if you look at the red script in front of you, there you can see the particular subskills of problem solving that are being covered by this particular task template or model. And we can plan assessment tasks around these particular subskills. So you're not going to see all the subskills within a particular complex skill in one task because it would have to be huge. So you, you pick up what you can with different types of templates. And so in this one, you can see that the particular subskills that we're looking at are planning solutions. And part of planning solutions is generating hypotheses. It's considering and comparing. And another subskill is planning the solution, developing the plan, predicting, and so on. So we go through all of these layers of specificity. Now in the column to the left of the red script, you can see a generic task process that rests on those subskills and it provides the model which teachers then can populate uh, with content from their, in this example, their mass curriculum. So then in the second row of the um, table, you can see that populating of the generic assessment type. So in that second one, you can see an example of a teacher who's used the template at the top 
and then cloaked it or populated it with some actual content. Of course, it's one thing to design a task. It's another thing to work out how you actually score it. And that's another layer that we won't go into today, but is something that we covered in optimising assessment for all. So having had a glimpse at one approach to construction of assessments, relying on understanding of the nature of 21st century skills, I'm going back here to the broad theme of ensuring that curriculum, pedagogy and assessment are all aligned both with each other and, of course, with the overarching learning goal, which is around the skill. So you may remember these images uh, from the last webinar showing how each part of the education delivery system impacts on each other. Here we look in more detail at what is required if an education system is going to try to integrate these skills into learning opportunities for students. So it's a reasonably large task, of course, as you can see, but then so is the aspiration. We're wanting to equip our students to face increasingly complex circumstances in their life. So curriculum, assessment, teaching, I'm going to leave with a few words on each of these. First, curriculum. There are many models of integration of 21st century skills into existing curricula. And there are many reform models for curricula, as many of you know. We still don't know the full extent of these. We don't know the full range of possibilities when we're looking at 21st century skills. Accordingly, the IEA um, is initiating a study to explore precisely this issue. So in this study, it will be about exploring and learning from each other and sharing the unique experiences from each country about how they are going about integration of 21st century skills. So if you think that your country might be interested in this study, please um, have a look at the URL on this, um, on this slide or, or contact me or IEA. Um, this doesn't require countries to think about assessing their students. We're looking purely at different integration models to see how we can best think about curriculum integration. And then the other two, assessment and teaching. And so we have, as I mentioned before, two representatives from the Optimising Assessment for All project talking today, one from Kenya and one from Zambia. So Winrose Rono from Kenya will be talking about the natural affiliation or association of competency-based assessment with 21st century skills. And Beatrice Mwewa will talk about the implications for teaching. Incidentally, these two illustrations are drawn from the work that we've undertaken together to develop assessments of 21st century skills. And these are described in publications that the teams have put together. So the publications are listed here. And again, you'll find all of this information up on the IIEP portal. So do have a look at these. They're in English and they're in French. So, and that's in, in part because, of course, we had um, both Anglophone and Francophone countries participating in the work. So I'll stop there and um, thank you for your attention. I'm sorry I can't see you all, but I hope that this was interesting and helpful for you. Before we move on to the next presentation, however, we're going to do a little poll. So if we'll move over to that now, that will be a good thing. Yeah, thank you, Esther. Um, so we have decided to have a more uh, uh, active uh, uh, approach uh, to the webinar, we just we just don't want you to listen throughout, but we want your uh, to hear your uh, your opinion uh, live. So I think soon there will be a, a, a poll um, that you will that will appear on your screen. Uh, I think you can all see it. So I'm reading out loud, but in the meanwhile you are invited to to, to respond to this poll. Very simple poll. Which do you consider would be the easiest to teach in the classroom? And then you have a list of uh, different uh, skills 
uh, down there. Uh, collaboration, decision making, problem solving, communication, entrepreneurship, self-awareness, tolerance, and critical thinking. So the first, this first question looks at what, in your opinion, is the, the easiest to, to, to teach. The second question looks at what do you think is the easiest to assess? So which do you consider would be easiest to assess in the classroom? And the same list of skills is, is there. So collaboration, decision-making, communication, entrepreneurship, self-awareness, tolerance, and critical thinking. Of course, you may base your answer uh, on your experience uh, of your country or your organization, depending on what your uh, uh, relationship with 21st century skills is. So I think probably you had enough time to answer to these questions. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, uh, our colleague, Julian, to, to show us the results so that we can see what are your feelings uh, related to teaching and assessing these skills. Ah, so we, we can see that collaboration and communication, because they are 56% and 53% are considered the easiest from, uh, from the audience that is attending the webinar today, uh, while entrepreneurship is the, considered the most uh, difficult one to teach. This maybe is giving us some thoughts on uh, how to integrate that. Uh, and also communication and collaboration are considered the easiest to assess. Uh, they switch their, their place in there uh, from, from the first question. Um, and we worked uh, on, on collaboration in the OAA uh, action research with the, with the three countries. Um, any thoughts on this, Esther, just before moving to the next question? If you can see the results. Sure, I can, Davide. Thank you. I, I actually find this really interesting because, um, as you say, we did look at collaboration both in Africa and in Asia, and it was actually one of the competencies that teachers found very, very difficult to manage in terms of the assessment piece. And also one of the issues around collaboration as a teaching piece was that it... Um, it, it often gets confused with teamwork and collaboration is not teamwork. Teamwork is not collaboration. Obviously, there's a lot of overlap, but one of the issues has been some of our mm, perspectives about teamwork. And so this is where we need to go to understanding what is the nature of the skill in order to understand it better so that then it is easier to teach. But at the same time, it's very nice to see that there's this very sort of... Um, positive attitude toward it here. So I, I really like that. That looks great. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Esther. And just uh, to, to respond to a couple of, of uh, the questions that are in the chat, uh, uh, problem solving was missing from the second question. So um, we apologize. We took out that, that option by mistake. Uh, but I think uh, overall, entrepreneurship was also uh, listed as the most difficult one. Uh, this is maybe giving us some, some thoughts on uh, how to develop a, a discourse around integrating entrepreneurship in teaching and assessing. And yes, what you said about collaboration really, it, it clearly came out, it was quite difficult to, to assess in the classroom. Uh, and uh, of course, we were making reference to face-to-face -to -face teaching and assessing uh, in this case. So let me give the floor to Mr. Ido again. Okay. Thank you. I don't know if uh, you guys can hear me. Can you hear me properly? Yes, of course. Okay, great. Thank you very much for, for this. I will, um, merci beaucoup à toi, Esther, pour uh, la présentation. Um, Thank you, Esther, for the presentation. This is a presentation that shows the complexity of uh, taking into account of factoring in these skills, 21st century skills, uh, 
And uh, again, uh, it really does confirm this complexity. And I really like the uh, list of skills that you showed, the various skills that we need and how these skills interact. And I also liked uh, the last point on structuring of skills and the type of collaboration one uh, needs in order to, to ensure a proper fit of the skills. I'm also very pleased with your last point. Uh, you see the skill, the, the, the surveys showed what are the skills that are the easiest to teach and assess. Uh, so uh, it's thanks to these practices that we could really capture the uh, feedback. Uh, and I really like this innovative approach. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Dear colleagues, uh, Esther's presentation has helped us see the various skills that we will need for the 21st century. And at the same time, we're now going to, the, going to move to the next presentation, which will be done by our colleague, uh, our Kenyan colleague, Winrose Rono, who will talk about a major point uh, now, with Esther, we saw what we need, what skills we need, and Mrs. Rono will tell us how we can assess these skills when they are taught in the class. So I'm going to give the floor to Windrose Rono, if she's ready, and she's got 15 minutes. Uh, Rono, you've got the floor. Hello, Hello are you there? Hello? Hello. Oh, can you can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, great. Can you activate your camera? I don't know if you guys can see me, but uh, it's less important. You are. Can you? Great. We can see you. Go ahead, please. Okay. Thank you. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to share with you uh, assessment of core skills uh, based on the Kenyan context. And um, my outline would be uh, the introduction. I will also share with you the core competencies that uh, Kenya has adopted, which are contained in the Kenya Basic Education Curriculum Framework. I will also uh, talk about the taxonomies of learning that have guided the development of uh, assessment uh, activities. And I will also uh, touch on uh, how to go about uh, developing authentic assessment uh, tasks. And finally, I will give a conclusion. So basically, I want to say that uh, education, educators have a responsibility to prepare generations. Therefore, core skills are very, very necessary for young people to live fittingly in an increasingly interconnected and interdependent world. And therefore, we ask ourselves the question, how can we embed core skills in the curriculum? In Kenya, we have adopted seven core skills that we endeavor to address through our curriculum. And the first one is critical thinking and problem solving. We also look at communication and collaboration. We have also adopted creativity and imagination. We have also considered digital literacy to be very critical, learning to learn, citizenship, and self-efficacy. So how do we go about uh, assessing these core competencies? Ideally, a good assessment tool 
is guided by a table of specification or uh, the assessment blueprint. I uh, normally a uh, table of specifications stipulates the levels and complexity of the knowledge, skills, attitudes, and values to be assessed for every task that is given to the learners. So these levels are anchored on taxonomies or classification of learning. And uh, competency-based assessment is in Kenya has also adopted the revised Bloom taxonomy by Anderson, Crathwell, and Depth of Knowledge by Norman Webb. So um, basically, uh, in which learners are asked to perform real life tasks that demonstrate meaningful application of essential knowledge and skills. For instance, the actual driving test is authentic assessment, while a written test on driving is a traditional form of assessment. So um, in authentic assessment, learners endeavor to create a response to a question, and the tests that are given to learners contain real life tasks, performances, or challenges that replicate the problems faced by an expert in a particular field. Learners are also given upfront the criteria on which their work will be judged or will be assessed. And therefore, learners demonstrate control over the essential knowledge that is actually taught using the information in a way that relieves the level of understanding. So uh, in Kenya, we uh, decided to adopt the authentic assessment uh, versus the traditional assessment based on the following factors. A traditional assessment requires the learners to demonstrate knowledge by selecting a response to a written test, whereas uh, authentic assessment requires learners to demonstrate proficiency by performing meaningful um, performance that require application of what the learners have learned. Uh, in traditional assessment, it measures learners knowledge of the content, while uh, authentic assessment measures the learners ability to approach knowledge of the content in meaningful ways that is reflecting the real life situations. It also provides teachers with a more um, comprehensive picture of what the learners know what they can do and what they need to know. So our learners are able to construct new knowledge of what has been taught. And it also provides multiple avenues for learners to demonstrate what they have actually uh, learned. Uh, authentic assessment also focuses basically on uh, competences as opposed to content, which is in the traditional assessment. And uh, competency assessment also uh, focuses on tasks and scoring rubric that are presented to learners in advance. And authentic assessment is also flexible as opposed to traditional assessment, which is rigid and fixed. And uh, authentic assessment also focuses on both the process and the product, while traditional assessment focuses more on the product. So what are the characteristics of an authentic task? They have varied responses. They are deeply integrated. That is, it requires many skills to respond to them. They also promote critical thinking and problem solving. And they also allow for differentiated learning. Remember, learners learn in different ways. So uh, for us to be able to cater for individual differences, we have opted for authentic tasks. Uh, they also involve planning, doing, reverse, revising, and also reflecting. And they provide opportunity even for peer collaboration. And they encourage self-assessment and deep reflection and require more time to complete. And I can give an example here. This is uh, an example that we also used uh, when we were doing a uh, uh, optimizing assessment for all guided by Esther Care. And as you can see, uh, that is a, an example of a scenario where you're talking of a crowded town, very large families, including grandparents and their adult children with their wives and husbands and children, 
or living in a small two or three room houses. So the questions you would ask the learners would be, what might such families be living together in such spaces? What problems might occur due to large number of people living in such small houses? And imagine you are a grandparent. What might you feel about the mayor proposing that extended families be housed in different houses? You can ask them to give one. And if you are a mother of four, what might you feel? Uh, uh, give uh, about the mayor proposing that extended families be housed in different houses and you ask them to give one positive and one negative possible response. You could also ask them, as a child, what might you feel about the mayor proposing that extended families be housed in different houses? And you can also ask them to give one positive and one negative possible uh, response. So if we can look at the checklist, you ask yourself, does it reflect uh, real life problems outside the classroom? Does it focus on high order thinking? Does it require active performance to demonstrate understanding? Is it involving? Is it interesting? Does it provide multiple avenues to demonstrate proficiency? Does it encourage the inter integration of knowledge and assessment? And does it address an essential skill or a key idea that you want to uh, teach the learners? Does it require learners to think? That is it open-ended? And does it encourage generation of, uh, of further questions about answers and solutions? And uh, when we are developing authentic tasks, there are certain considerations that we must uh, have in place. For instance, it must have an action verb, which addresses the why, the how. And usually when you give, uh, when you actually consider an action verb, it will always lead to deeper learning. It must also have the object and it must have the context which reflects the real world challenge or a problem. And in most cases, you wouldn't encourage, uh, you wouldn't provide a task that would require one word answer or a yes, no response so that you can allow learners to think deeper, to find out more and even uh, allow for collaboration. And so it doesn't have to have a straightforward method of working it out. Three more minutes, please. So in, okay, in Kenya, we have, um, we have further broken down the core competences into sub-skills, as you can see, in critical thinking, and problem solving, it has the sub skills, communication and collaboration, self efficacy, imagination and creativity, digital literacy, citizenship, and learning to learn. So, in essence, we are saying we don't, uh, for ease of uh, assessment or teaching and uh, reinforcing and even assessment, we have broken down the core skills into sub skills and even sub sub skills. So uh, in conclusion, I want to uh, give this, uh, this quote by Peter Drucker, who says that the only skill that will be important in the 21st century is the skill of learning new skills. Everything else will become obsolete over time. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you very, thank you very much to you for this very inspire, inspiring uh, presentation. Thank you very much. It was, uh, very good. Um, I particularly like the starting point, you know, the seven skills that uh, uh, you underline. And the first one, which is uh, critical thinking and problem solving is very, very important for Africa. We know today in edu the education system in Africa, we teach memorization more than critical thinking and problem solving, you see. So, uh, and it is a challenge for curriculum developers. How can we promote more uh, critical thinking and uh, uh, initiate, initiative taking by, by learners instead of uh, teaching them memorization of, uh, of, of uh, the, the courses that we teach is a, a big challenge. And I also, like, it was very uh, interesting to see your proposal between traditional assessment and authentic assessment and the, 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 the very good way that uh, we should go. And uh, we, we could see the element of the authentic assessment are very, very clear and they will make a difference with what we used to have so far. And um, the examples of uh, 
uh, of question to be used also for the authentic uh, assessment are very clear with uh, this checklist that are also like, and uh, people can adapt them to their context. I think uh, they will give really uh, some elements that will enable us to be sure to have relevant uh, uh, evaluation and assessment tools in place for the 21st century. And I thank you very much for, for, for that. And uh, your last uh, quotation is very, very inspiring too. Thank you very much to you for this. And uh, let me now uh, go to the third presentation for 15 minutes that will be made uh, by Beatrice Mbewe from the Zambia. And uh, that is a, will be related to how to approach the teaching of problem solving and collaboration. And uh, we are going to listen to you. Uh, uh, you are going to take, this is uh, mainly based on the first skill that uh, was uh, proposed by uh, Noro concerning the critical thinking and problem solving. Okay, come so, on, you. so you are going to, to tell us how to address it. Thank you very much. Take the floor, please. Your mic is muted, Beatrice. Yes, I'm here. Yeah, we can hear you now. Please go ahead. Okay. Okay, greetings from Zambia. Yeah. Greetings okay. everyone. My assessment, my assessment is on, um, my presentation is on assessment um, and teaching of uh, the 21st century skills focus on Zambia. Beatrice Mbewe, a class teacher. So I'm going to have a snapshot of uh, Zambia's 21st century skills. Then we'll have a quick glimpse of uh, the mini study findings. Then we'll look at uh, the curriculum documents and the 21st century skills. Then uh, we'll go to the pedagogical strategies as applied in uh, classroom teaching and learning. Then we are also going to look at uh, the current status of the 21st century skills in the six schools. Then I'll end with the recommendations. In our case in Zambia, the 21st century, the 21st century skills are already prescribed in our curriculum documents. As you can see from the vision, the vision is um, quality to provide a quality long life education for all, which is accessible, inclusive, and relevant to individual, national, and the global value systems. And our mission is to enable and provide an education system that will meet the needs of Zambia and its people. And our aims are as follows, to have self-motivated long life learners who are confident and productive, uh, who are productive. Um, also to have learners who can strive for personal excellence, uh, build the positive relationships with others and become good citizens. And the, as for assessment, we use uh, the Broom's taxonomy. In all this, we are striving uh, to have uh, learners that exhibit competences such as uh, critical thinking, problem solving, creativity, and uh, cooperation, just to mention a few. Uh, at the beginning of this uh, project, um, we conducted a mini study where some assessment tools were gathered from selected schools and uh, 91 tools were collected. Out of the 91 tools that were collected, only 28 uh, tools uh, captured the, these uh, 21st century skills. That is to show, to say actually the teachers did not know a lot about these uh, 21st century skills. As you can see from the graph, collaboration was actually absent uh, and even uh, learning to learn. Uh, here now I present uh, one of the examples of uh, the tools that were uh, gathered during uh, the mini study. We have uh, actually a question here uh, for a science question where learners are supposed to carry out an experiment and 
observe, make observations and then draw conclusions. Now, from what you can see there, there's something missing there because uh, learners cannot make uh, conclusions without uh, uh, having a column for uh, evidence. So you can see to say such questions uh, needs to be tweaked a bit uh, so that they can be improved upon, so that they can uh, capture the 21st century skills. As I earlier indicated, uh, we already have these uh, skills embedded in our curriculum documents. So initially in 2013, we came up, uh, the ministry came up with the education curriculum framework. Uh, but this uh, document was too technical. It was so difficult for, for teachers to, to understand. So uh, with the help of uh, uh, teachers on board, uh, the ministry came up with another document, which is known as the uh, curriculum the teacher's curriculum implementation guide, or in short, the TCIG. Now this one is practical and simple for teachers uh, to understand. Uh, in this uh, same document, the TCIG, and that's where we have all these uh, uh, competences, uh, which are also known as the 21st century skills, uh, which are communication, cooperation, critical thinking, problem solving, uh, creative, creativity and innovation, entrepreneurship and self-management. Uh, initially, us in Zambia, there are eight if we have to separate critical thinking and problem solving, uh, creativity and innovation, you will find there are eight. Okay, as I earlier said, these are, are already prescribed. These are some of the pedagogical uh, strategies that uh, we use. As you can see, we have uh, discovery and the learning uh, by doing uh, these uh, strategies, they capture critical thinking and problem solving, as you can see from the examples where learners, for example, in discovery, learners are given an opportunity to find their own solutions to uh, real problems or challenges. Uh, the teacher may set the task, but the learners, uh, the learning itself is self-directed. So these two, they, as you can see, they capture critical thinking and they're problem solving. We have other uh, strategies such as debate uh, and role play. These ones, as you can see from the examples, they capture uh, collaboration, uh, collaboration. And uh, we have a whole class uh, discussion where a number of skills actually uh, are used there. Uh, it's not only collaboration or problem solving, but uh, we have uh, collaboration, problem solving, and uh, actually self-management because uh, the, teach, the, the pupil themselves actually uh, uh, take full control of what is happening in the class where one pupil becomes the teacher, becomes the facilitator, and uh, then we employ what is known as the no hands up approach uh, where every learner is expected to at least answer a question so they do not put up their hands and uh, uh, names are uh, drawn from, they are pulled out from a heart to ensure that uh, uh, gender issues are also promoted during the learning process. We also have uh, pair work. It is, uh, this one also um, uh, captures uh, uh, collaboration, as you can see from the examples. Uh, then, uh, as I said earlier, to say our education system is in inclusive we have not left out the children with the special needs. They, are also, they have also been uh, uh, taken on board as far as uh, the 21st century skills are concerned. As you can see from the example, we have also a group work uh, which captures the collaboration. As I earlier indicated, uh, this uh, project is running in six schools uh with the grades as you can see and uh, we made sure that uh, these schools are from different areas uh, such as uh, the urban areas very urban and uh, also the rural setup uh, this is because uh, uh, all our learners from these areas they write the same exams at the end of the day so this the teachers in these schools actually are very excited because they have seen the benefits of uh, what these skills can do we have not left out the examination bodies also, since they are also involved in the uh, setting up of uh, uh, assessment tools. 
So this is uh, not at national level as yet. So because of that, we still have a, a homework as a country. Uh, we are looking at uh, orientation of the serving teachers so that they can also uh, start employing, start uh, teaching, start uh, uh, inculcating these skills in our learners. Uh, we are also uh, build, we are also trying to build capacity uh, of the teacher educators in both the colleges and universities so that even as they are training uh, the teachers, as these teachers graduate, they already have uh, a background of uh, these 21st century uh, skills. And then um, the current and the future index of trainee teachers, as I've already indicated, must be trained in these ones uh, so that uh, um, they already have uh, the knowledge on uh, these uh, 21st century skills. Then we are also trying to capacity build the teachers to enable them develop tools that measure the 21st century skills. Uh, there's also need for the ministry and also co cooperating partners to fund the rollout of uh, the orientation uh, so that uh, teacher educators and uh, serving teachers have an opportunity, you know, yeah, as a country to have some knowledge in these uh, 21st century skills. There's also need for the examination setters and uh, classroom teachers to align the education goals assessment and also pedagogy of the 21st century skills as identified in the curriculum to successfully translate what is written in the curriculum and put it into classroom uh, practice. Uh, thank you very much for attention. Uh, I end here. Thank you very, very much for uh, keeping on time. Thank you, really. And uh, thank you for sharing this uh, very inspiring experience of the Zambia, and, uh, namely the problem solving uh, strategy. Um, I particularly uh, like the, your pedagogic st uh, strategies, uh, which put an accent on learning by doing, because we could see that uh, the learners are really at the center of uh, the learning process by having a very active role to play in the process. And this is really where we should more and more go. And uh, the, also you spoke about uh, the learning self-directed. Uh, all these are things that really uh, make learners more active and particip they participate more when uh, they are inspired. And uh, you can also only see the kind of a confidence that uh, yeah. you have played and uh, in the role that yeah. you get the learners to play in the, in the learning process. So. Uh, yeah. I also noticed one of uh, your approach, which is very yeah. inspiring. It's a, 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 a new for me, uh, the no hands up approach, you know? And uh, when you say that uh, this will really yeah. uh, enable also to solve the issue of gender and uh, with yeah. the no name, et cetera, in the process, I think the, all these yeah. are new approaches that need to be uh, uh, documented and, uh, and, and shared. I'm yeah. sure the organizers of this meeting will uh, make sure they are really uh, uh, well shared. And uh, your recommendations yeah. at the end were also very, very useful and uh, inspiring. And uh, I'm sure they will help a lot of countries who yeah. would like to, uh, to, to be inspired by your experience on the way forward and what to, how to, yeah. to, to, to move. Uh, forward. Thank you very much for, uh, uh, for this uh, really interesting presentation. And um, um, uh, unless, uh, on the agenda, we can now, we should now go to uh, the presentation number, number four, which uh, uh, is, uh, unless David uh, tells me something else, on the agenda, I can see integration of life skills into pedagogical practices. France, Education International, has the floor to make the presentation. Is it uh, Stéphanie? C'est toi qui va faire la présentation? Oui, tout à okay. fait. D'accord. La parole est à toi. Merci. Bien, merci beaucoup, euh, M. Ido. Bonjour à tous. Thank you very much. Good morning to all of you. It's a pleasure for me to be here and it's a pleasure to see that so many countries are present and represented in this webinar. To start with, I would like to thank Lynn and Luc, David Efra, and also the Wet Talent Network to allow us to participate, for allowing us to participate in this seminar. And 
I will talk about uh, the strategies and the pedagogical practices which will allow you to develop and integrate these competences. And uh, this is also the result of a field work carried out in different countries, uh, mainly in Morocco with two of our experts, uh, Denis Pajot and uh, another colleague. Hop, on a just un problème. So very quickly, just to introduce ourselves, France Education International, we are a public entity of the French Ministry of Education, and our mission focuses on international cooperation in different countries, and we work mainly with education institutions to help them build and reinforce the capacities of the, uh, the, the staff. We work in different fields, we support a sector uh, policy in education, support to curriculum, support to, to uh, teachers' practices. And since 2017, we have uh, more specifically, and together with uh, UNICEF, uh, carried out different uh, projects uh, dealing with the integration of life skills into education systems in Tunisia, Egypt, Burundi, Djibouti, Morocco, Haiti, amongst the others. And we have in September 2019, in our facilities, uh, organized a uh, uh, workshop on uh, these uh, life uh, skills and we brought together uh, different international organizations. So our approach and our uh, idea is to uh, improve the capacities of the different uh, um, uh, act players so as to integrate these life skills into their subject matters while contextualizing the different approaches. As we have seen, teaching life skills is no more just a question mark, it's just something obvious. But if you um, learning in different uh, fields is also indispensable, but nevertheless, we have come to realize that this knowledge does not necessarily lead to acquiring the necessary competences to become part of uh, the society and the world and fulfill a pleasant life. And these uh, uh, competences and skills can only be uh, acquired if they're really well integrated, if you learn them. But how can you do that? How can you and make these competences, uh, uh, these life skills uh, uh, perceptible to people? We have uh, worked uh, <coughs> In different directions. This is not a model, uh, these are just ideas, but we believe it is very important to develop theoretical frameworks, contextualized frameworks, uh, which could be uh, understood by all. You have to think about the very nature of these uh, skills, as um, Esther uh, rightly said earlier, and we have to develop uh, conceptual frameworks uh, which are tailored and adapted uh, to the countries in which they will be used and specifying which what each subject matter should be working on and finally also start thinking about uh, the advantages of um, uh, these uh, multidisciplinary projects for instance on the right you have a table which was developed in the framework of this project in morocco with teachers and inspectors and this table shows you a sample of competencies and skills and we can see what is the nature of this the skill the definition the examples which make it easier to have access uh, to it in the classroom and what are the uh, characteristics or the activities, related activities, which allow us to understand the meaning of this competence. And the last uh, column to the right should be completed to add, uh, uh, to, to propose a everyday life uh, to that, that would allow you, uh, everyday life situations that would allow you to use these skills. Another um, field in which on which we've been working is means integrating these life skills or the 21st century skills in pedagogical practices or in the classroom means that you have to modify the pedagogical practices. So you cannot de develop critical uh, minds uh, or any other social and emotional competences without uh, uh, active methods uh, based on the principle that you learn more and better if you de develop your own knowledge. So all teachers and the students must review the way they teach and learn. So therefore, the teaching and training teachers is very important. And you have to think about the way teachers are, are trained. The project uh, pedagogy is also very important because it's very important to develop these uh, competences. And uh, 
this should allow uh, the, the teacher to um, develop the, the, these different uh, methods and role playing investigations uh, etc are things that can make um, that can help the, the teach the student become a player in its in his or her own learning and develop therefore the necessary competences a third uh, element which is also very important is that the integration of such skills means that the teachers should plan things in the details at the time the teacher prepares the, the session he or she has to choose a situation that will help develop one or two skills but not more otherwise uh, they will be lost and identify how these competences uh, are um, can, can work and be articulated with the existing curriculum and define when it is time to go and work and what are the characteristics uh, they will focus on? Uh, they all will also have to think about uh, the assessment of such competences. Just to, to note that it, during the year, it is important that, that different uh, skills be in the part of the curriculum with uh, uh, links with other colleagues, their activities and the multidisciplinary activities or links with this uh, school, uh, life in the school. The teacher must also define objectives, two types of objectives uh, related to the subject matter and the skill. Ideally, based on certain indicators which have been uh, predefined. The teacher must also choose uh, the necessary supports and identify what are the pedagogical uh, and the most appropriate uh, approaches and uh, the work modalities, uh, etc. And finally, the student must know what are the competent skills on which he or she has been working. And this means that he has to be able to give a name and explain these skills because it's explaining that structures uh, learning gives a, me a meaning and allows uh, students to become the agent of change in. And to the right, you have a table which has been developed by um, an inspector, a physical education inspector in Morocco, showing the, the, the objectives per subject matter, per skill, and giving the details of the criteria, the indicators, etc. Something on the selection of skills. Are there skills categories? Now, all subjects can actually work on all skills, but uh, for certain subjects, uh, certain skills can be worked even better. The natural trend is to choose a select skills uh, depending on the subject so problem resolution in, in mathematics communication and language and literature and uh, there's also a risk that some skills can only be used in certain subjects. So it's really important that the subject uh, uh, should really see what contribution they can make to the skills. The second, then you've got uh, skills linked to the organization uh, in the class and working methods and the interaction that the teacher can have with the class. And we, when we have group work, it's not enough to basically work on cooperation. You need to go a step further. And then the third group of uh, skills, which is really uh, things like decision making, resilience, empathy, and these are very, very hard to work on. So it's really uh, important to have new learning situations that, that can integrate these skills and not just uh, put them on the side. Now, I'm going to give you an overview of uh, the various pedagogical strategies that helps develop skills. Uh, the first step is that the teacher must uh, propose a problem triggering situation and which should be a major intellectual challenge. Uh, then there should be a task. It could be different depending on the student and uh, they have to identify one or two skills that this uh, exercise is going to mobilize. And if possible, practices uh, such as uh, uh, that is close to the private or the professional life of the student must be privileged. 
And this should all be interesting to the student. And you've got three examples on your right uh, that have been uh, actually derived from our observations in Morocco, and they actually trigger a problem. So then you've got the investigation phase where the teacher, whether this student is making hypothesis assumptions, and uh, this means he's got to use knowledge and use the skills, creation, uh, creativity, and uh, cooperation. So th this me makes the child uh, the heart of the problem. And uh, the teachers and students have both said that this is great. And we've seen that uh, there's been a behavioral change, that uh, the behavior is positive, and the children become more responsible thanks to this. The next phase is the critical phase. So you really need to understand the problem. You need to see the what are the mistakes to analyze. And this uh, phase really requires the skills. You really need to go on, listen to others, not be discouraged. You need to convince others. So it's really a, a time where you're building your skills and you're learning how to learn. And in the end, the most important thing is conceptualization and structuring knowledge. So this is where you are thinking. So you're going to basically think on what has been done, on the skills that have been developed or acquired. And all this helps the student to understand how he's progressed and how he reacted. The validation, with, then you've got the transfer phase and then reinvestment phase. So it, it's about re, you, reusing uh, um, skills acquired in a different context rather than the initial context. And this again would re require other skills as well. An important point to underline is that uh, we need to have uh, uh, teaching methods that develop skills and knowledge. So we really need to create those situations that can be applied to various contexts and all with a view to me measuring or validating, validating how these skills are acquired. In students, like in classes, you have interdisciplinary projects, uh, the school time, and these are the moments where we can basically check if these skills have been acquired and can they be applied to other uh, context. Now, family time is important, as, but there's also uh, projects at the community level, community projects that can uh, be a useful platform for developing these skills. So we really need to basically contextualize and adapt things to the reality. So it should be linked to various situations in the student's life. So personal life, uh, professional life, public life, school life, and even the cultural life. Because skills basically are of twofold use. First of all, developing skills with regards to one, to, to Pers at the personal level, so and also developing skills uh, f that are of professional use. Uh, so all this would turn the student into a good citizen. Now I'm going to finish by giving you an overview of uh, the cross-cutting skills. Now, when you have such an approach, it's, it's a long process and it has consequences on the duration of the class, on the organization time. So you've got uh, common time to develop uh, interdisciplinary uh, skills. And then uh, the ways you are seated in the class, uh, all this has an impact on such subjects. And we also have to develop skills between various levels of school and also uh, interdisciplinary skills. So that's the example to your right that was developed by an inspector uh, in Morocco. So for each year, first year, second year, third year, there should be uh, pro indicate there should be indicators 
uh, that work around cognitive, conceptual, behavioral, and procedural. So this is a example of a progression chart that has been developed. And then you've got life competences and cross-cutting skills that will really bring everything together, all the skills together in class, outside the class, in order to increase the exposure of the student to these skills and also make the skill transfer easy. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for this very good presentation. And uh, I've basically noted that you focused on pedagogical strategies and practices. You also underlined certain points, for instance, how to make the various uh, skills uh, easy to acquire. I think this is going to be of great inspiration to uh, teachers. And the stress on interactive methods, and that is quite similar to what the Zambian colleagues said, and the active role of the learner, the learner who should be uh, in charge of his own skills and uh, again uh, a learning learner center the attitude and the learner should be able to explicit the skills he should be able to structure the various uh, knowledge uh, that's been acquired and you've actually shown very very good indicators that really help us measure what the uh, learner has earned and has learned and uh, what kind of problems can he tackle using these skills. Uh, uh, then the choice of skills uh, that you listed, we talked about the end use of these skills, which is also very important. And in your conclusion, when you talked about the uh, triggering power, the uh, ignition power, so to speak, of these uh, cross-cutting skills. It's, it's really quite interesting. And you shared indicators that can measure the uh, skills that have been acquired over time. So again, very uh, good presentation with a lot of information. And now I'd like to thank you and uh, if there are any questions, you can take them later. Thank you again for this great presentation. Now, we've actually, we've got a small survey here for the participants. Yes, in one minute. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. So we have, uh, thank you for this uh, presentation, Stephanie. So now we're going to ask you, what do you think uh, are the major obstacles uh, to the integration of uh, uh, 21st century life skills into teaching practices? Uh, so, so according to you, what do you think are the major obstacles? You've got several choices. Uh, I'm going to very quickly read them. So overloaded curricula, duration of class sessions, lack of uh, teacher training, assessment systems not adapted to these skills, lack of institutional support, high number of students per class, and lack of uh, national theoretical framework. So at the same time, what is the biggest added value of integrating 21st century or life skills into education, into teaching practices, into the, uh, is it getting the child to bloom in society, have great citizens, motivated and more involved students and promotion of uh, values like tolerance or a uh, more efficient education system. Uh, 
you have more choices. Now, we've got only five minutes. I was wondering if you could very quickly close the poll and see the results, please. So then we can move on to the next question. So as you can see, it's quite clear. And this was also the case in the online chat. The lack of teacher training is uh, the major obstacle uh, for the integration of 21st century skills. And uh, we've seen uh, with various countries, and we've actually stressed upon the importance of teacher training. Moving on very quickly to the second question. So it's a bit more balanced here, but the biggest added value is uh, the blooming of uh, societies of uh, certain of teachers. Now, given the time, I'm going to ask Ms. Edo Mati to choose one or two questions. Ido, what do, you, do we have questions for one or do we have time for one or two questions? Yes, thank you. I think we can actually take about two or three questions. Mati, yes, thank you. There was some answers on the chat, so we're just going to choose a few questions, two questions uh, for, it's doc, for Dr. Esther Kerr. In the 21st century, parents and teachers uh, see new problems. What plans do you have to increase the skills of parents and teachers in order to rise up to these new challenges, especially in remote areas such as Burundi? And then how can you measure the change in the skills of the 21st century? Yes. Perhaps a third question, if you have the time in English. Okay. For the adoption of 21st century skills in the curricula of developing countries. I'm sorry, Mati, I didn't get the beginning of that question. Yes. What uh, strategies I... should be developed for the adoption of 21st century skills in the curricula of developing countries? Ah, thank you. Okay. So, I mean, I, I could talk for a long time about these things, but I'll just quite do it rather, rather quickly. I really can't help you with the question about parents. It's not an area that I've, um, I'm familiar with at all. So I'll, I'll park that one in case somebody else can pick it up. I would say in terms of how to support teachers with the teaching that we have found under OAA and in some other work I've done in a couple of other countries that teachers come to understand the nature of these skills reasonably easily. So I think one of the major points is to ensure that we don't frighten people and, and make something look much more complicated than it is. All of us actually can solve problems and can collaborate and can communicate. All we need to do is to make sure that people understand what all the contributing competencies to that are. And I know in some of the training that we've done in a couple of countries, I shouldn't call it training, I should say it's co-development, we have been able within three or four days to ensure that teachers do understand a pedagogical approach to at least skills like collaboration, communication, problem solving and critical thinking. And that actually leads me to another point that I think we need to be careful about which skills we talk about uh, for teaching in mainstream education. We need to make it uh, that they're, they're skills that are teachable and learnable, not assume that we can cover everything. And we need to be very careful about discriminating between what a skill is and a competence and what a value or an attitude are. These are different things and sometimes they're being all pushed together. So we need to think about that. Um, in terms of measuring change in skills or measuring development, this comes to what I was talking about in my
speed test to ensure we pick up competence. Look, I'm aware it's 10.30, so unfortunately I won't go to that last question, but we'll make sure that we pick it up on the um, on Slack and on the IIEP portal. So thank you, uh, Mr. Ido, I'll pass back to you. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you very much uh, for this uh, response, but uh, you know the second question on uh, uh, the, uh, how to measure the competencies, I think that uh, the different presentations gave a lot of uh, this. So as uh, 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 David said, the presentations will be shared with the participants. I'm sure that they will find in uh, the presentations uh, responses to that uh, question uh, that uh, uh, Mati uh, uh, underlined, uh, namely, comment mesurer les compétences du 21e siècle. The presentations were very uh, informative on that level. And uh, uh, about the teacher also, Esther has just responded rightly, but uh, the, apart from the, the, the competence issue, there is also the great thing is the motivation of teachers, because apart from the competence the issue, the, the, the issue of motivation is the key in uh, teacher performance and uh, it should be equally addressed. So thank you very much, Esther, and uh, all the colleagues, uh, and merci à toi, Mathieu, aussi pour les questions. Alors, je sais pas si David, on peut maintenant... I don't know, uh, David, if we can move on to the next, uh, or the last bit, or is there something else you'd like to share? No, no, unfortunately, we do not have the time. Uh, we've actually come to the end of the webinar. I just wanted to remind everyone that the, uh, that the questions that were not answered will be answered online, where people can register themselves. Uh, we've already explained how to join the online portal. The next and the last webinar of the series will be conducted on the 19th of November, 11 o'clock Paris time and 10 o'clock Dakar time. But we have to end this webinar, so I'm going to ask you to say the last word. I'd like to thank all the participants. Thank you, David, and congratulations to everybody to the participation to, uh, for your participation. We've seen that the 21st century skills uh, uh, are very, very complex, uh, and because there are so many uh, skills that we are unaware of uh, now in 20 to 30. Uh, yes, 70% of these uh, of employment of, of current jobs will disappear or will change, but we do not know what skills will be required to fill in the future positions. So we've got to anticipate and think how to train uh, our children so that they can uh, occupy these future positions uh, that will be quite different. And we, again, what type of pedagogy and teaching methods and what evaluation. So we've actually taken stock of all this. We've seen that these skills are very complex and how we can deal with them in the classroom. So I would like to thank you all for your wonderful presentation. And I'd like to wish everyone a very good day. Thank you so much, Ido. Thank you, everybody. Goodbye.